Welcome to this session, Revolting Parents. <laughs> Lessons from the School Gates. My name's Chris Beckett. I'll be the chair for this debate, and I'd like to thank Nancy to start off with for putting this panel together and um, putting the debate together. So thank you, Nancy. And also thank you to this strand's sponsors, both the Academy of Ideas Education Forum and Don't Divide Us. So what I'm going to be talking about today it's quite a hot topic at the moment. As you know, over the past few years, there's been a lot of changes in the education system for better or for worse, depending on your opinion, largely due to COVID and the kind of social movements and um, the kind of cult culture wars that were brought to the fore because of that whole process. So um, I'll introduce the speakers in, or in the order that they're going to speak, which will be from my right over to my left, in fact, but just to frame the debate to start with as well. There's always been a problem in education, and that is who controls the curriculum. Is it the parents? Is it the government? Is it a local body? And so on. Okay. And I guess one of the big questions around this, and that has been brought through a lot of the debates on this strand and a few of the other ones that I've attended today as well, is who has control of the curriculum? Who has control of what children hear, what children are taught? and what opinions that are put across the children. So I guess that's a central question for us today. Who has control of that? And is there a democratic mandate for that to be done? So moving on to the speakers, our first speaker will be Nancy, McDerm Ma Nancy McDermott. Excuse me. Nancy's an author of The Problem with Par Parenting, How Raising Children is Changing Across America. And she's also a chapter leader of the Foundation Against Intolerance and Racism. Next on my right here is Toby Marshall. To Toby's a film studies teacher and a member of the Academy of Ideas Education Forum. And if you've come to the um, battle before, you'll be familiar with Toby. To my left, although not politically no, in any really way, shape no. or form, <laughs> is um, Yaron Brook, chairman of the board of the Iron Rand Institute, host of the Yaron Brook Show and co-author of In Pursuit of Wealth, The Moral Case for Finance. Um, to Yaron's immediate left is Joanne Nadler, who's a political commentator and a campaigner with the Don't Divide Us um, campaign group. Be the correct, correct term for it, wouldn't it? I think so. And lastly to speak on the end there is Christina Jordan, who's a commentator on diversity issues and former Brexit Party MEP. So could we just welcome the panel, please, to start off with <laughs> So, revolting parents, are there any lessons from the school gates, Nancy? Right, well, the reason I wanted to uh, put this forum together um, is that um, when uh, the summer of 2020, uh, when uh, the Black Lives Matter protests uh, uh, came out and uh, all our kids were at home with them uh, in the pandemic, uh, and we begin, began to... Uh, discover that our kids were being given exercises where they were supposed to go through and um, explore their white privilege um, and or explore, you know, their, their um, uh, how intersectionality affected, you know, their, their role in the world. Um, it was, a, it was a, a, a real watershed moment because for most of my lifetime, uh, Americans have not been that involved in politics. And all of a sudden, around the school boards, um, uh, people across the country began to speak up. And you know what we discovered was that um, it was almost like there was a house with termites, where you, you, know, you sort of noticed that there was a problem, and then you pushed a little bit, and everything fell away. Um, and so there's a new awareness amongst parents um, uh, that uh, the schools were really inculcating their kids um, in values that uh, were a real break from their own, um, things that went against um, what most Americans believe, which is uh, in inequality. Um, uh, you know, uh, uh, Martin Luther King's vision of uh, of, a, of a promise that belongs to all Americans, regardless of where they come from, regardless of the pigmentation of their skin, um, and and so so anyway, so it was this it was this horrible moment when um, when parents began to discover that this you know not only was going on in schools but had been going on uh, for some time, and it was the most exciting thing 
uh, uh, in my political lifetime. Um, so I became involved in it. Um, but what I discovered fairly quickly um, is that there are some significant challenges um, that the, um, that the uh, American parents movement faces. I'm not even sure that, I, that <coughs> it's accurate to, to call it a movement at this point. Um, because uh, uh, because the the challenges of leadership are are so serious, but so I just wanted to to kind of give you an idea of some of the things that we have found in trying to address not just the 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 issue of uh, critical race theory in schools, but also gender ideology. Um, or we found that um, uh, there's a deeply entrenched pedagogy that has existed and pre-existed um, uh, 2020 that has been in development through nonprofits and educational foundations for over a decade. It, I mean, we had no idea, really. Um, and that uh, uh, trying to do something about it is very, very difficult because um, uh, in American politics, uh, there's a divide between professional politicians and ordinary people. And I think one of the interesting things is that the reason why this flashpoint was around school boards is that's one of the few places that is still a public place uh, where people can come and actually express their opinions. Um, uh, and then there are tremendous uh, technical challenges um, in the United States trying to address something over 50 states where there are 50 different sets of laws. There are 50 different um, sets of uh, local circumstances and expectations. Um, and uh, so that makes it very difficult and unwieldy. Um, but I think the most serious, uh, the most serious uh, challenge for uh, people who want to, uh, do, to, address, to address what's going on is the old straitjacket of left-right politics. And what you can see in the United States now um, is that there's this attempt to kind of place uh, parents wanting to have a say in what their children are taught um, with either left, uh, with, with right-wing politics. And so the moment that you speak up at a, at a school board meeting, the moment that you're critical, the moment that you question, um, uh, you are likely to be labeled a bigot. You're likely to, to be labeled um, a, a white supremacist. Even you know people who have been lifelong liberals um, who have been members of the Democratic Party. Um, and one of the things that we are seeing um, in western New York, where I live, is that there are people who are being excluded from speaking at school board meetings simply on the basis that they are Republicans and that Republicans, and that therefore they are extremists. It's become incredibly, um, incredibly polarized and contentious. And yet, at the same time, when you sit down with parents, what you discover is that they are of all political persuasions. <coughs> and what brings them together is this, uh, is this belief in traditional American ideals of being able to become part of one country um, uh, to, to be something greater um, than just you know, how you were born or where you were born. Um, and it's very interesting because it's almost, like, it's almost like you get this sense that there's something new in the world, something trying to come into being, um, and that it's being held back uh, because of these old loyalties and old political forms. So that's, so that's, that's in, in incredibly, um, in, incredibly frustrating. Um, but, uh, but at the same time, you know, I, I, I believe that uh, we can overcome these challenges. But I think that, I guess, and what I'll conclude on in my remarks are that, it, are that you know, it's about education, but it's about more than education. Um, it's about politics and how we do politics um, in an era that hasn't included ordinary people um, for a very long time. Um, and how do we, how do we uh, turn a critique of something that we don't agree with happening in our schools into a positive vision of what could be that can pull people together? So that's, that's where I see the, the challenge now.
Thank you, Nancy. Um, so turning over to Toby, who I guess could give us a bit more of a <coughs> British English perspective on this debate. Thank you. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, Excellent. Yes. Okay. Um, so the blurb that we're speaking to quite rightly points to the growing tensions between uh, parents and teachers over values. It asks if uh, there's, there's a lesson from the US uh, that parents should be trusted to safeguard children's education. My short answer is no. Um, it is teachers who should safeguard education, but parents can, of course, uh, be our partners um, in this. In this introduction, I hope to explain uh, how we might make this happen. But overall, I think the best thing that teachers can do, in my view, is to not get involved in the culture wars. Um, when they do so, three things happen. First, they undermine educational standards. Second, they deplete the trust that parents place in teachers. Third, they risk turning schools and colleges into repressive institutions. So I hope to explain those points. Um, when teachers engage in the culture wars, they undermine educational standards because the goals of education and politics differ. My job as a teacher is to faithfully and fairly represent the diversity of human opinion and to cultivate the intellectual autonomy of students by stimulating debate about these opinions. My aim is not to win arguments. Victory in the context of the classroom is the intellectual growth of students. And as soon as I start advocating for a particular position, as soon as I start to propagandize or become partisan, I introduce external, instrumental and non-educational goals into the classroom. As such, I undermine education and abuse my position. This brings me to the depletion of parental trust. Um, in England, the issues which have become flashpoints recently include racism, gender identity and religion. Each one of these issues is important, both in their own terms and within education, but it's important to recognise that these are issues over which society is divided and schools and colleges are in no position to resolve these divisions. Being seen as partisan on these issues that divide society can only undermine the trust of parents, many of whom will hold views that differ to those of the teachers. So this is my final point on the problem of getting involved in the culture wars. Uh, when we do so, uh, we risk turning educational institutions into repressive institutions. Every citizen in this country, I believe, has the right to send their child to a school that respects the autonomy of that child. This autonomy, I'd suggest, includes a student's right to hold and express beliefs that run counter to those of the teacher. By taking strong stances on issues that divide society, by adopting a stance of advocacy, and by demanding student assent, which is going on at this moment in time, schools and colleges exert undue pressure on students with dissenting viewpoints. As such, they risk being experienced as repressive institutions, and they frustrate the very dialogue that is the lifeblood of education. So what do we need to do? The first thing uh, that we need to do, I believe, is to step back from the issues themselves um, uh, and look at the general principles by which controversial topics might be handled um, within education. We should recognise that the issues that are causing dispute uh, relate to deeply held social values. Dispute over them is inevitable, healthy and unlikely to end, end anytime soon. So by trying to force a consensus through education, all we're going to do is introduce conflict within schools and colleges. Any agreement to be reached on these issues must be reached by adults outside of education. At the same time, we should recognise that there are, in fact, two sets of values which are at play in this discussion. There are the values that relate to the wider societal debates and the culture wars, and there are those that are internal to education itself. My point here is that by allowing the culture wars to dominate within education, uh, we displace the internal values by which educational goods are generated. In my view, these internal values the teachers should be, in fact, defending include, but are not exhausted by, a commitment to truth, tolerance for intellectual diversity, respect for the moral autonomy of students. We can, of course, uphold these values whilst teaching about the culture wars, but when we advocate for a particular position within the culture wars, we undermine them. In my view, it is the values such as these that teachers should, should take a stand on values such as these. So how do we move forward? Teachers, I believe, must indeed step up and address the problem of values within education. Change, in my view, must come from within and not without. 
and it is t as it is teachers who deliver education. One thing teachers need to do, somewhat paradoxically, is to become more political about education so that education might become less politicised. Um, they need to argue for a new politics for education. And what I mean by this is they need to take responsibility for constructing and maintaining a protective barrier around education. And they need to go out into the public sphere and argue for that. Here what they need to do is to make clear what Basil Bernstein once called the voice of education. Having done this, they must also take an internal focus and take responsibility for professional self-regulation. This means being big enough to give and receive criticism. We all, on occasion, <coughs> breach the advocacy line. No one's got clean hands here, and um, particularly when we're teaching about issues that we care about. When we do so, we simply must self-correct. Uh, thank you, Toby. So, Yaren, coming over to you, is this a political campaign? And if so, what might be the consequences of it? Um, so, so let me uh, let me take a, a little bit of a broader perspective here. Uh, you know, I, I remember watching a an interview that uh, Steve Jobs, the founder of Apple, did in the 1990s, uh, that that I thought was quite insightful. And he talked about education, which surprised me because I didn't know Steve Jobs had opinions about these things. And one of the things he mentioned, which I think was quite shocking and surprising, but absolutely true, is that parents in the United States, and I think this is true of the UK, and I think it's true in much of the Western world, parents in the United States spend more time considering what shoes to buy than considering what education their children should have. They spend more time on choosing a, uh, a bassinet for their baby than on choosing the school that they will send their kids to. Parents have basically abrogated the responsibility of taking control over the education of their own children by being able to choose the school. And this is a consequence of the way education has been basically established and run for the last hundred and so years in the Western world. And that is, it has basically been, with some exception for the wealthy, it has basically been a monopoly of the state. It has basically been run by government. So uh, during COVID, when parents suddenly discovered that the education their children was getting was politicized, where have you been? Of course, the education your child is receiving is politicized. It's been politicized from day one. Maybe the politics of the moment are politics you don't like, so you get offended. But it's always been politicized. It has to be politicized. You cannot have the political establishment running anything without that thing in this case education, being politicized, having a particular political agenda, driving a, politi a particular political point. So, you know, it should be no surprise to anybody what happened in COVID. Um, it, 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 it's, but it is, of course, and that is because parents have basically, uh, for, for, for forever, not involved themselves in the education of their children. Look, as long as things uh, are left to school boards, which then become a political entity, and people yell at one another and argue with one another and vote to decide what should be in the curriculum, or as long as education is completely left to teachers, which who are mostly trained in uh, teacher colleges that mostly have, unfortunately, a specific political agenda that might not be consistent with that of the parents, and, and I admire Toby's perspective of trying to be a teacher that reflects all perspectives and, and being objective about this, and that, that would be wonderful if teachers were like that, but, but that's the minority. Let's be honest about this. This is a minority of teachers, and even if you are that, I was just at, uh, at an independent school here in London on Friday uh, giving a talk uh, to the political politics class, the, the, the uh, A1, I think, politics, and the curriculum of that class is set not by the teacher, not by the school, not by a school board, but by somebody here again, you know, in Westminster somewhere, by some government official. And it's rigorous, you know, these are the thinkers, yeah, oh, conservative thinkers, it's kind of funny, they put Ayn Rand as a conservative thinker. Here are the liberals, and they put people, here are the feminists, and they put people who are uh, clearly feminists in the liberal category, and people who are liberal in the feminist category, and the bureaucrats here got it all messed up, and the teachers have no real say in it, and the parents have zero say in it, and but that's the curriculum, and it's politicized. Of course it's politicized. 
It, it, do you think the curriculum will be exactly the same if a conservative government is in power or if a liberal government is uh, uh, a labor government is in power? Of course not. So uh, the only solution for this is a solution nobody wants to hear, and that is the complete separation of government from education, the complete separation of politics from education. Politics should not be involved in education. Education is a profession. It should be left to teachers, and they should market themselves as good at it. Schools, and this is a point Steve Jobs made, why aren't they billboards advertising schools? Why aren't schools trying to sell to parents and parents choosing which schools to send their kids to, schools that might be consistent with their values? Or schools that are opposite of schools that try to be objective. Let's see. Let's put it out in competitive realm of ideas. Let's see what wins out and what doesn't. So while one could argue that government should continue to uh, pay for education, and you could do this through a voucher system, uh, what is certainly necessary is that the government step away from dictating what is in our schools, liberate our schools to make choices for themselves, and create real competition. Who knows what innovations we'll get in education if we actually had competition, actually have competition for education and, um, uh, and, and privatize the entire system. Thank you. OK, thank you, Aaron. Maybe a debate that's happened in England actually over the past, I don't know, 20 years or so, um, but one that's not yet been solved. But I'll hand over now to Joanne to give her opening remarks. Um, I'm going to spend some time, I think, after this session thinking ab about what we've heard already today. I'm not sure it's completely accurate to say that British parents haven't been involved with their kids' education. I think parents spend a long time thinking about what kind of school they want to send their kids to and then potentially moving house to be near one that they want to be or joining a church or whatever it might be. Um, they're engaged in the system. Um, and I found myself much more engaged as I was introduced as a campaigner. I've sort of become a campaigning parent. And it's really not a role that I particularly wanted for myself because I never saw myself as the sort of person that was constantly phoning up my school to complain um, or, or to, shall we say, make some uh, constructive uh, suggestions. Um, and the reason that I felt pushed into that situation was the sort of changes that have happened in the school, um, which were a step change, I think, away from what Joram might have been talking about as a broadly sort of political um, perspective in schools to something much more specific and, and targeted, which interestingly, coming on from what Nancy was talking about, um, whilst we have a different political culture here to the States in, in many ways, um, the sort of things that you were talking about having seen in schools from 2020 were just replicated so specifically in many identical ways over here. And then my son goes to an independent school. Uh, it's a very um, well-known, reputable independent school. Uh, and yet the sort of things that we've seen there are very much like the sort of public school system in the States. And I'll take you through a little bit of this just to give you a flavor of what's been going on there over the last year or so. So the first thing, and it, this is nothing like this had ever happened before. So within two weeks of the murder of George Floyd, all parents received a letter from the junior school head um, to say that uh, the school would review its practices, that uh, it would um, consider its staffing policies. Uh, whether or not we think that's appropriate, it just had never happened in relation to any other international event in the previous five years that I was at the school. So, you know, I noted that. I wasn't quite sure what it meant. Um, and then later that same year, there was a big, um, I'm sure many people will remember, there was a big um, campaign called Everyone's Invited, which targeted independent schools particularly, and it was the sort of Me Too movement of, uh, of, of schools. And again, I think there was some value in that. Uh, however, what happened was it pushed a lot of schools into sort of a panic about how they were going to address these criticisms in that, in that sense, particularly that you know, boys were behaving in, a, in an aggressive and inappropriate sexual way to, to, to girls on, uh, within school campuses. And so what did happen was that by the end of the school year, we'd had a, you know, a huge change in processes in the school, including a whole raft of new appointments, uh, an ED, a, a new EDI committee, a head of diversity, a dedicated head of PSHE, 
Uh, we had a huge ramping up of safeguarding procedures, different safeguarding leads, and what I'm now calling a Maoist Ponzi scheme, which is the Pupils Diversity Champion Scheme, which is the idea that pupils will take responsibility for inculcating younger pupils in various sort of ideological ways of thinking. Uh, the new EDI statement of the school said it wanted to assist pupils in realizing their authentic self. Um, anyway, um, so this is a school, can I just say, um, which, great, let's talk about inclusivity, but it's an independent school that you have to pass a lot of very difficult exams to get into, and you have to be able to afford, and has just spent a lot of money on building very glossy sports halls and music halls, all of which I think it's probably marketing on the basis of exclusivity. So I found that irritating just in the, in the sense of um, the sheer sort of slightly hypocrisy of the whole thing. So we then, we then learned that the, the staff had undergone racial literacy training. Pupils were being familiarized with right, white privilege, unconscious bias, microaggressions, uh, they'd set up an Afro, this is in, in their terms, an Afro-Caribbean society so that the black pupils could have a safe space on campus, as though all the black pupils on, on campus were necessarily from an Afro-Caribbean background. Um, and, you know, I felt that this was just very uncomfortable because it suggested that there had been a lot of racial incidents and that, that there had been problems on the campus. And in fact, one of the reasons I chose that school was it was well known for being really diverse and, and having a very sort of pluralist uh, culture. Um, what became evident soon was that these sort of structural changes were also being matched in the curriculum. So over the course of the last year, my son had a series of no fewer than three PowerPoint presentations on the human rights group, Black Lives Matter, um, which I downloaded the presentation from my son's laptop, and they did appear to have come straight from the BLM website. So there's no context. All the examples were American. So I queried this, and I was told not to be concerned. Um, but then what happened was the follow-up lesson, uh, the boys were asked to watch a TED Talk by Ibram Kendi. And the teacher, um, in what was called the Theology and Philosophy stream, I've now renamed that Ideology and Assertion, um, was then the school chaplain, and she told the white boys in a mixed class that they alone should consider their unconscious biases, and if they didn't do that, then they were probably racist. Um, this was followed up by a session in the library, where the librarian introduced a Black History Month reading list, which was almost totally ideologically uniform. Um, and an interesting explanation that as a person with disabilities, she could empathize, she could particularly empathize with the suffering of black people. Um, what can I say? Um, I, I assumed that this was her stab at intersectionality. Um, and to back up intersectionality, there was a non-binary exhibit in the corridor outside the year nine classroom. Um, and just a, a general constant hectoring messaging about gender and sexuality. The first lesson that my son had in the senior school um, was a quiz on gender stereotyping. Um, music homework was to research an LGBT composer, nothing necessarily to do with what they'd composed. Uh, there was a competition to redesign the school logo in the pride colors. There was an ex another exhibition in the library about different sexualities, which included opening boxes. Um, and each box explained a different type of sexuality. I'm being told to hurry up, but I just really wanted to take you through the huge range of these things. Um, transgender toilet signs, a drag queen spoke to the sixth form about the prejudice you'd faced in the workplace. Uh, a well-being counsellor discussed whether men or women have better orgasms. I mean, I, I could go on, um, as you can see. But I will cut myself short, because obviously I'm going to hold things up. The point is that... I decided I had to do something about this, and I got involved with Don't Divide Us, but I also started to research the background to all of this. I wrote to the school, I asked for meetings, I pushed back, I engaged other parents, and to cut a long story short, they had, one of the things I was most concerned about was the fact they wanted to bring in some external consultants to teach PSHE. I looked at these consultants' websites. They were completely age-inappropriate for children. They were explicit, very, very explicit uh, sexual messaging. 
And uh, having engaged a lot of the other parents, the, basically the school pulled out of a contract at the last minute with this agency, which was quite a big deal because I think, A, they'd been, you know, they'd been advertising it for a long time, and secondly, they were in a contractual relationship with them. Uh, and it, it was literally happened at the last minute, so I think they, you know, they had to consult lawyers and all the, all the rest of it. So my message uh, is really, you ha parents have to get involved. I don't think we're, we should be at odds with teachers. I agree with what Toby said. I think we can work collaboratively. Um, but I don't think that uh, we can afford to sit back and just say, let the experts do it. Okay, thank you, John. <laughs> I must say, um, being a teacher in the state sector, the independent sector sounds like has a lot more ideas, a lot more money to throw around. <laughs> so if your children go um, to school in the state sector, you can be assured we're not doing any of that stuff because we just can't. <laughs> um, so, Christina. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Yeah. When the US sneezed in 2020, the UK dutifully and ever so carefully transported its culture virus on super fast broadband and in print to our schools, institutions, and companies. A number of politicians and many in media, academia, public bodies, sporting organizations, and businesses knelt, swore an allegiance, an oath of allegiance, and expected everyone else to follow suit. Those of us who wanted this contagion studied and carefully examined, put into quarantine at point of entry, and treated with disinfectant, were called racist racial gatekeepers, coconuts, fascists, bootlickers, enablers, and Uncle Toms. Many more, but I'll, we don't have enough time. But we knew that kneeling for an untested, divisive ideology meant paying for a one-way ticket on the high-speed victimhood train. Once you agree that life, people, and events should be viewed only through the prism of color, you sign a blank check for members of the indignant and permanently offended club. Race is the weapon of choice to shut down debates, to meekly accept regulations, quotas, box ticking, and the rewriting of our country's rich and fascinating history. It has made its way into our schools and universities. Ironically, the very people who shout racism at everyone and everything they disagree with have absolutely no self-awareness when they display it. They see their high-vis morality jacket as a uniform of righteousness. They get a free pass when they spout racist drivel and are given lucrative book deals, television appearances, and non-jobs such as diversity chiefs to lecture everyone about white privilege, white supremacy, white guilt, oppression, microaggressions, and systemic racism. They are not challenged when they demand a no whites allowed safe space. Those who rush to embrace critical race theory are not breaking down racial barriers, they are reinforcing them. Depending on whether you're a man or a woman, we're talking biological sex here, not gender, you would have to have been living on Mars and Venus, not to have come across the many acronyms now blighting our daily lives. This pick and mix of alphabets enables subscribers to jump cues and demand preferential treatment. It is 21st century's equivalent to the sharp elbows. Tick that minority box and you enter diversity, inclusivity, and quota heaven. I have lost count of the number of times I've come across jobs and internship adverts that mention color, race, and ethnicity as a prerequisite on the application form. This myopic approach raises the question as to whether successful applicants are being hired based on ethnicity and not merit. Many of us already know the answer to that one. We also know that racial favoritism gives rise to feelings of resentment amongst applicants who lose out on university places and job offers because our opportunities are our color-coded lottery. They feel discriminated against for being white, and rightly so in my opinion. If you cannot, must not, should not discriminate against a student or an employee because they are black, brown, Asian, etc., then why is it okay to discriminate against individuals when they are white? If you can't exclude people because they are not white, then you cannot exclude them because they are. How can we promote and live in racial harmony if everything is viewed through a color lens? 
Why are more of us not challenging the mantra that our country owes you because you were not born white? What sort of legacy are we leaving future generations and what are we teaching our young if noisy activists are allowed to demonize whites and use skin color as capital? I'm nearly done. It really isn't surprising that parents are getting twitchy about what exactly is being taught to children. I do not put these parents in the same bracket as the rent a mob crowd who demanded the sacking of a Batley a grammar school teacher. Many of the men, and they were all men, came from afar, wanted blasphemy laws and religious censorship brought in, and forced a dedicated teacher and his family into hiding because of death threats. That protest was not about inappropriate lessons. It was intimidation. It was criminal. It was unacceptable and a, a disgraceful period in our history that will come back to haunt us all. I cannot help but wonder if the authorities concerned ignored it for fear of being called racist. And in doing so, they came down the side of bullies and hung an innocent man out to dry. The disquiet over this whole sorry episode will never go away. And all those who stood, stood by while an innocent teacher was vilified should hang their heads in shame. Critical race theory and unconscious bias training is flawed divisive and harms race relations. Plastering victimhood labels on non-whites while heaping blame on whites for acts they have not committed and offenses they have not caused will not promote racial harmony. It will, however, push us all towards a climate of intolerance, suspicion, and fear. The organizers of this weekend's event may or may not agree with some or all of what I've said but they allow free thought and free speech. I just wish schools, universities, organizations, and public bodies had the same backbone. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Christine. And I know I have plenty of questions off the back of what the panel said, but we'll come straight out to the audience. Does anyone have <laughs> any comments, any questions? Go, go to the gentleman right at the back. I agree with Yaron that the government should be involved in schools as little as possible and I find the idea um, of it being up to the teachers to advertise their skills and abilities as educators interesting and an experiment that we should run. Um, however, as you suggested, the field of education is increasingly being overrun by radical political activists masquerading as scholars. How do we solve this problem? Would the free market approach be enough to resolve this and don't we see the same radical ideas in private schools who have little or no government involvement? Thank you. One of the speakers I did disagree with when it was said you must try not to get involved in the culture wars. Well, try not to. But um, it's a bit hard when the head teacher wants to decolonise the curriculum and you've got to prove that you're implementing diversity, equity and inclusion and you're in trouble with management if you don't do it. And when there's 60 outside agencies or so that are advertising to promote equity, diversity and inclusion. Um, so that, that, I think, is a non-starter, unfortunately. Parents are needed to support teachers, in my opinion, and, one of the, and I think they can play a very big role, and one of them is to be governors. Okay? I don't believe, believe in the Randian kind of free market approach, but I do think that, that uh, there needs to be checks and balances. And I think there's a real big difference between the religious, religious fundamentalists that you saw outside in Birmingham you know, objecting about sex education per se, and the parents that are objecting to CRT and social justice being taught that are on the school boards of America. But what I would like to see is more and more liberal teachers working with parents to challenge and push back the agendas that we're seeing, and I'm yet to see that. Uh, building what you're saying about the stuff you found from your son's school, um, in our school uh, we had a son from the NEU come in um, and to give us a talk around anti-racism. Uh, three key points. One is obviously uh, everyone is racist, uh, that's the, the position. Uh, second point is that um, uh, to be colourblind, to try and not see people's race, that is racist, racist. as well, yep. uh, because you're ignoring the past, of course, oppressions, and that's why you've been racist. And finally, the most <laughs> difficult for everyone was there was that they were using throughout this booklet, which I think we were then intended to, to take out, the word black to refer to everyone who is not white. Um, that, was, that was kind of mad. Uh, the other thing that was interesting to me is that it made me also realise a question I hadn't been asked. So this is my sixth or seventh year as a teacher in the UK. 
I've never been asked the purpose of education. Not once in my training, not once in our staff, in ATNL. Basic question, what are we doing here? Has just never been talked about. Uh, and that was yeah, mind-blowing to me in some ways. Lastly, about the school line thing, I'm not sure in the sense that if you look at the history, the state as emergence emerges with the school. You know, those two things go together. You make citizens through schools. So I'm not sure about the viability of a state that didn't educate its own citizens. I'm going to make a slightly contentious point. I think actually the state needs to be more involved, not less involved in education. I mean, I'm a university prof, and if you take, say, the U.S. university system, a lot of private schools, a lot of choice, and of course this stuff is worse there than anywhere else, so I think you can get a lot of conformity regardless of choice. The reason I say we need more government involvement is because at least government is elected, the media scrutinizes its platform, uh, and, and it's, it's transparent in a way that what happens in schools is not transparent. Um, and the other thing is that the, the culture war, I call it a culture conquest, that is going on in the schools is being driven by activist teachers. Sorry, it, like the universities, there's no way it can be resisted from within just because of, for a number of fact, reasons to do with the ideological tilts of the faculty, to do with the, the shame people feel standing up to these things. Uh, so governments can be judged on their records. If they go in and they issue guidance that says you must be impartial, we're going to define racism this way and not that way, we're going to constrain what you're allowed to do, they can be voted out, they can be voted in, but at least it's transparent. Whereas what's happening now is simply a conquest from within. If politics doesn't get involved, the game's lost. So I think we do need to raise this to the level of national politics, as is happening in the United States. That's got to happen in Britain too, because otherwise it's just lost. So I'm going to just take a few of the questions people have asked and pose them to a few of the panel. So, Toby, decolonizing the curriculum, good or bad idea, does it not broaden um, the opportunities and the thinkers and people that students get to meet? Uh, it's a category error. There's no such thing as a colonial curriculum. It's a curriculum. It's not colonial. Colonialism is a political enterprise. Uh, a curriculum is a body of knowledge. So it's just a category error. It's a silly idea. Um, so I just wanted to come back a bit on um, some things that Jan and Joanne suggested. Um, so uh, what was suggested, I think, is that there's an important social base out there of parents that can resolve this problem, or alternatively, um, that there's a, a, a magic mechanism, uh, such as the market, by which this issue, by which these issues might be resolved. I, I think that both of those missed the point. Parents are divided over this issue. Uh, I think that's the nature of the culture wars. No one group can claim overall authority on this. Society is divided. That's actually true. There isn't, you know, a tiny number of right or left culture wars people that have hijacked the discussion. There's moral change going on and there's differences of opinion. Um, so I don't think there's any magic constituency that you can point to that's going to resolve your political problem and your philosophical problem, which is prior to the a market mechanism or looking to a particular group in society, which is defined, as this gentleman said, the philosophical, or have an answer to the philosophical question, which is, what is education for? So all of that comes prior to any, any of uh, mechanisms or agencies. You, you've got to clarify what it is education does uh, and um, what it is that it doesn't do and what the reasons for that. And there's a history there and there's a social differentiation. Educational institutions are differentiated, specialised institutions for the purposes of transmitting and engaging people in, in, in knowledge. I, I disagree with one of the points that was made from the floor, that, that, the, that the state is going to be the mechanism by which this is resolved. We've been here before, the national curriculum, 1989. We've had 30 years of the state getting involved in all of this. Um, and I, that's why I think the pushback has to come from uh, w w within education. Um, but, but I don't see, you know, um, but, but teachers, you know, uh, we have politics, we're using public money, we should be accountable for that. But there's this whole set of philosophical and political discussions um, that we've got to have. And I think whatever we do, we need to, our move needs to be asymmetrical. You can't fight the politicisation of education with the further uh, politicisation of it. You've got to repose the question in a different form by pointing to the, the, the specialisation of education, the reason why education is not another institution that is there for resolving adult political debates. It's got its own particular internal code and set of purposes, 
And that's what we need to go out into the political sphere to make the case for uh, both of those teachers, with parents uh, and with students. Thanks, Toby. Um, Christina, then, just kind of picking up on what a few things Toby just said then as well. This is all about moral change, is it not? So why should we not equip children in schools with um, these new fairies and these new ideas that might help them go out and make the world a better place? Can I come from it from another point of view? As in, does that mean that all of those who have come before now have failed? Are we not, do we not have morals? Do we not have the education that has enabled us to go forward and do good in the world? I'm hoping that, you know, I'm one of those. But why is it suddenly now everything is about morals and you've got to be seeing everything through colour? One of my friends is in, is in a school... Uh, as a governor in a school in a little village in Hampshire, and they've been, and she was told, Do you know, we need to have more diversity in this school board. And she's saying, well, first of all, number one, it's a voluntary position. Number two, where do you want me to find these diverse citizens to come forward? We're in a little blooming village in Hampshire. <laughs> um, so how is that going to help the students? And that's also, in a way, whenever you bang on about colour, it really annoys me because you put all of us, me, in one group and we're victims and we need the, you know, the, the, the lovely, good white people to come and help us and tell us how to think and, and that they've been mean to us and saying hurty words. We don't need, we need to move away from that and just use bloody common sense. Thank you. Um, Joanne, as you're kind of participating in the free market in education, do you think that solves all the problems? Well, obviously not. <laughs> I mean, I think to a certain extent um, what I've seen, and I think a lot of uh, parents I've come across would testify to this, is that the independent sector um, feels that it has to make itself more relevant um, and it has its own sort of guilt essentially, and it's trying to justify itself um, in what is a largely socialist culture uh, by bending over backwards to, or, or rather by getting on board with a lot of um, quite uh, modish ideas without, probably, without properly testing them, without interrogating them. So, you know, when I went in to talk to the head teacher and to talk to the head of PSHE, uh, and, and the head of diversity. I, I Don't get me wrong, I wasn't saying you should not discuss these ideas. My point was just that they need to be set in some kind of a context. You can't present these things which are largely assertive as being factual. Uh, you, need to, you, know, you need to teach the children that there are different ways of looking at these issues, not just what the, you know, the BLM PowerPoint presentation says. You, you, you have to um, encourage the children to think, not, not what to think. You have to teach them how to think and, and to question things. And that seemed to me to be sort of first principles. So a lot of the discussions that we're having across the board here, it seems to me, uh, can be addressed by, uh, and, and the gentleman from the floor who said that you never really discussed what, edu what education was for. I mean, there are these first principles, and some of them are actually encapsulated in the Education Act. And we do have, um, to the gentleman that asked about the role of the state, I mean, I think the problem that I've come across speaking as a parent is that the state institutions in many ways seem to be captured. Um, and you don't really know where to turn. I don't necessarily theoretically disagree that the state doesn't have a role in this. Uh, but I just don't know how we can wrestle that's the state apparatus back from where it currently is, which is, which is, as I say, seemingly captured by this very radical ideology. Thank you. Um, and Yaron, so there's a problem in the UK when it comes to schools, which we call the postcode lottery, which maybe in the state you'd call the, the zip code lottery, <laughs> where um, you know the best the best schools are in the mm -hmm. most middle class best sure. areas. Would the free market idea, as you pose it, would that not just fall, again, just, in fact, exasperate that problem? No, on the contrary. The exact opposite uh, would happen. You would actually get uh, a focus on competition to attract, just like you do in every other market, to attract people who are less well off to educational institutions that compete on quality. The idea that poor people cannot choose qu uh, quality education for their children is insulting 
to poor people. Um, you know, yes, it's true that if you're wealthy, you can choose your zip code. It's true that if you're wealthy, you can go to independent schools, even though, as we saw, that doesn't solve the problem. But if you're poor, you can't. You're stuck with one school. You're stuck with no options. Uh, a market creates options for everybody, and that is the beauty uh, of markets. And the idea that you cannot create, um, uh, you know, economized educational schools that provide excellent education, I think, again, is, is wrong. Let me just say, I, I, I agree with much of what Toby said, particularly with regard to the fact that there's a, a, you know, what we really need to focus on when we come to education is this idea of the, the philosophy of education and, and the, uh, the foundational ideas. But I think it's wrong to assume that CRT um, and, and the rest of what's being described here is mainstream. It is not mainstream. Uh, it, is, it is a fringe on the left. And you can see that by the fact that, at least in the United States, in San Francisco, uh, which is about as left as you can get in the United States, they voted off school board members who are advocating for this kind of curriculum in a leftist place because they, because it's so fringe and yet it's come to dominate. You know, just to address some of these issues, look, when you have competition, yes, the people who love CRT, the, pe the parents who are committed to CRT, that little fringe will have their own schools. And let them do it, right? That's their kids, their responsibility. It'll be sad for those kids, but so be it. Uh, the rest of us will be able to send our schools and we will demand, as we demand, of, of a service industry in every other capacity to fit our needs, which doesn't include this kind of uh, material. Now, how teachers will adapt to that, I, I think they'll have to. There'll be competition about what is the philosophy of education. What is the purpose of education is, is a great question. I think it's it's... It's one, but we might have disagreement here about the philosophy of education. Well, let's have schools competing about a different vision of a philosophy of education and let parents make those decisions about which schools to send their kids. So it doesn't solve all the problems. Fundamentally, we still have to have the debate about <coughs> what is education and the philosophy of it, but it provides avenues for competition and avenues for experimentation and avenues for segregation of, uh, of parents making choices about their own kids' education. I think this is ultimately a parent's choice. Okay, thank you, Aaron. <laughs> and finally, Nancy, I'd be interested to hear what um, one of the gentlemen made, made a point about that it's the state that makes citizens. Do you think that's right? Well, what, sorry, and what problems might there be with that? Well, okay, so here's the dilemma. Um, is that uh, whether we like it or not, um, what has happened is a breakdown of consensus. Um, and it's coming out through education because that is where the rubber hits the road uh, in terms of what are our values and what are the values that we pass on to our children. Uh, the problem is, is that um, there is a generational divide um, and there is an institutional divide, because it is true that the institutions of the state have been captured by ideologues. Um, and then to make it worse, there's also a sort of non-governmental um, aspect of that. So even if you do things at the level of the state, you still have all of these organizations putting pressure um, onto, uh, onto schools um, and uh, onto other uh, uh, entities to try and um, uh, have their ideological way. So, um, so I, I, I think that we have to be prepared to have that political discussion. But the dilemma comes in um, where you do have, where you, where you have a situation where um, uh, parents are aware of this and they want to do something about it, um, and the state is aggressively pursuing a woke ideological line. So you can see this in the state of Virginia, um, where, uh, where uh, you, uh, you have, um, th th just last week, uh, there's now a bill in the legislature that will make um, refusing to affirm your child's ident uh, gender identity a felony, um, you know, which is absolutely outrageous. But that is a pushback uh, against parents uh, uh, electing the governor, Glenn, Glenn Youngkin, who was willing to say 
um, uh, no, this, uh, you cannot indoctrinate children like this, and we're going to prevent certain things. So I think, I think that um, the dilemma is that if we do not say no, if we do not um, put limits on this, it will just keep going. It will just be, keep going because you have a whole um, generation of young teachers who this is just the way that they think. And you know, you've seen the libs of TikTok videos. I mean, it's like that is what they do, is they go in and they undermine. Um, and so you know, I think it may come to a point where we do have to actually um, have that argument out, democratically elect people who say, no, we're not going to do this, particularly not with young kids. I mean, these ideas, we don't want to suppress them, but we want to have them in a context where it makes sense, you know, at university level. So they're not the only idea being taught, but they're one of many ideas. Um, and so I, I, think, I, think, I, I think we just have to uh, be prepared to do whatever it takes in the circumstance to stop what's happening. Just to ask then, just off the back of that, you said there's ideologues in control of education now, but hasn't there always been? Mm -hmm. There was a there was there was a there was a consensus a broad liberal consensus so you might you know you might quibble about certain points um, but people basically believed in a certain bottom line of liberalism but woke is not that woke is an entirely new moral system based around the self and based around identity politics so it's it's fundamentally different than what it was i mean you've always had people who've tried to control education that's true but it within, but it was within a certain framework this is a completely new framework um, which is being brought in and is trying to uh, usurp basic <laughs> fundamental values hey thank you um, so let's go back out going on from that last speaker's point i want to push toby um, a bit, because I, I think, I mean, I'm a great admirer of what Toby does, but I, I think he's being a bit utopian, if I, if I may, because he's kind of su suggesting, well, there's moral change afoot, and, you know, maybe that's open-ended. Um, we don't quite know where that's going, and it, it's forced for the next generation to sort of work out a lot of those tensions. Um, but isn't that just a bit kind of wishy-washy, given the kind of situation we're in, that the last speaker just described, when Toby turns to the movement to decolonize the curriculum and says, well, you've just made a category error, um, I know what he means, but I'm not sure that's going to, you know, that's going to cut it. Um, where are the people who are going to come forward to, to make the argument that you can't decolonize maths in time? to prevent the mass curriculum being wrecked for a generation. I mean, we may put it right down the line, but there's a whole generation of kids who are going to receive a really bad maths, history, English, whatever, curriculum. Um, I just need a bit more meat on the bones, Toby, to sort of say, you've made a category error, and I've sort of dealt with that. My question is possibly a bit um, tangential. I don't think so, actually. Uh, it's about faith schools. I'd be interested to know what the panelists feel about faith schools. So, and picking up on what Yaron said about private education, how uh, you would feel um, about faith, called faith schools, uh, which may be promoting values which are the polar opposite of the values that I know you espouse, um, and that... Um, uh, faith schools who, uh, who, um, uh, which uh, adopt what I would regard as quite an extreme set of values um, may, uh, may be partially regulated, uh, but uh, there are uh, cases in, in, um, that have been publicised where faith schools have been promoting really what I would regard as quite harmful uh, views. And... I do resonate um, with um, what the speaker behind me was saying about the um, importance of, um, or how the state possibly can uh, imbue a sense of cohesion um, uh, uh, as uh, looking at things on the positive, uh, in the positive side of the leisure. So there are these uh, things that sort of somehow contradict each other. Um, so something that 
I'm not clear. I'm not a parent, but um, uh, I was particularly, sorry, just to finish up, I was particularly struck when I attended a, a National Secular Society conference and a very young chap, he was probably, well, he was not that young actually, 22, he had been brought up in a Hasidic community. He did not speak English until he was about nine. I was stunned, I couldn't believe it. In the last two weeks, I've had the uh, pleasure of visiting four uh, secondary schools for my oldest child, who's starting in a couple of years. And um, they are all competing with each other because we live in a, an area like that. Um, but what they particularly are competing on is how far they are pushing their ideology. The academic levels seem to be very, very similar, but they're all really promoting how much of an individual they're going to make the child. They've changed citizenship to be personal development lessons. They have three hours a week of um, trans information, BLM. The <coughs> posters are everywhere, how to be a trans ally, BLM. Um, and when I speak to them and I say, well, don't you think a lot of these can be you know, controversial and should be from home? They say, oh, no, because we know the laws on hate speech. We're, you know, and we will tell the children if they're using hate speech. And it's better for the children to come in and use hate speech at school so we can tell them when they're wrong so they don't use it when they go out in the world and get into trouble. So I am torn because one of them will have to be my son's school. Do I tell my son to argue back? I'm just interested in what the panel think about safeguarding. Sorry. Safeguarding. Um, if you are trying to challenge critical race theory or gender ideology in schools at the moment, many of the people that you will stand alongside um, use the threat to their children's safety as the argument for why we should be preventing this kind of indoctrination taking place. And it seems to me that one of the things that said in another session I went to is that identity politics coexists with the technocracy. And when you look at schools in the UK, one of the most technocratic things is that schools have changed their raison d'etre, that they think their role is to safeguard children. And if we could somehow shift the political terrain at that level, so school management wasn't about risk management to kids, but was about education again, that alongside the identity politics might be make things easier for those that are campaigning? Or what's your advice to people campaigning that say we need to stop this because these people are perverts and they're a risk to our children's safety? How do we shift the terrain on that kind of thing? Um, I just had two questions, really. Um, one was uh, something that Joanne said. Uh, I, I also went into our school and said, these are assertions. <laughs> and I just don't understand why you are saying that to adults. We are saying this to adults. And that there isn't a con... I mean, I'm just interested to know what you think about this. Why don't these adults understand these things when they're teachers and they should absolutely understand them? The second thing was about uh, parents going in. My experience was that really there were no parents that would stand with me because I was in a very sort of middle class state school go to... They didn't want to get involved. And even the few that maybe just hinted they would, wouldn't, in the end. Um, and so it seems like I, I don't really know what to do about it. I mean, I took her out of the school. There she is. Um, it seems like a wider, uh, a wider problem because it's in society as well. It's like it's in the air you breathe, essentially. I just wanted to say that the independent sector has no indication of what a privatised education system would uh, give us because obviously it's for elites only and they actually benefit and create this moral code. Um, so I think if the working class or poorer classes were able to vote with their feet, we'd see something very different. Um, I still think, um, you know, that I, I feel a little bit nervous about full deregulation in that sense. I think we need to have a na cohesive nation um, and there is a role for the state, but maybe in a voucher system, which they also have some role in, there would be a way to, to increase choice that allows people to offer a totally different schooling perspective. And then the people who don't get to say and choose would suddenly be able to do so and we'd see a democratic response. Um, I also just wanted to say, but I do agree with Toby, that this issue is prior to the market. This is a moral uh, sort of cultural movement. Um, but I want to suggest it isn't just a moral cultural movement. 
Uh, the activists who, and, and I've witnessed this in my own school and complaints that I've taken uh, almost to law, um, they are breaking the law. So this is constitutional. It's not just a moral argument amongst ourselves. It's not just social discussion anymore. Um, and the, so the only reason that's not being put right is because the civil servants and the regulators believe in the law breaking. Um, that's how serious the situation is. I don't quite know how you fix that. I don't know where the higher power is at that point. Um, but what we do need to do, possibly, before the law is changed to codify their view, is use it. So I've tried to go to law several times to, to correct uh, my school um, and have uh, a situation where the Information Commissioner's Office has actually ruled that lesson plans will be kept secret from me so that I can't even contest them properly. So that's how serious it is with our, our, um, our uh, you know, uh, institutions being captured. So we'll come back to the panel. Nancy, I'll start with you. Um, safeguarding, that is an interesting question. I, I left school in 2009. I've been working in school since 2014. And in that space of the five years, I safeguarding became the main raison d'etre of uh, what they call SLT, the senior leadership in schools. Um, so whose who's responsibility is it? Is it the schools, is it the states, or is it parents? Well, I think that um, you can't get around the uh, issue of parents' rights in this. I mean, parents have a right uh, to bring up children in accordance with their, va with their values. And teachers need to work with parents to come up with, a, with uh, 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 an education that passes down values that people are comfortable with. And I, I, uh, I think there is a sort of a, at least in the States, I don't know if that's, if that's here, there's a kind of reluctance um, where it's like, well, the only people who want to stand up and say anything about the trans stuff in the school are the Christians. And well, I, you know, I don't want to be seen to, being with, to be with them. Um, you know, which is, you know, kind of priggish and middle class. But, but, I mean, my feeling on this is that we have to, uh, we have to uh, recognize that there is a problem with um, the breakdown of the line between adults and children. Children are being exposed to things that they are too young to be exposed to. Um, they are uh, being ushered into adult ideas about sexuality and gender in a way that is completely inappropriate. Um, and I think we have to be prepared to um, uh, get over ourselves and work alongside um, uh, people who we may you know, not agree with on everything about the things that we do agree with. Because the important thing is that we don't have to agree with everything, but we have to agree with certain fundamental things. We have to agree uh, that it's important for adults to stop using children to pursue their political agendas. We have to agree uh, that children need a childhood and should not be ushered out of that through the education system. And I mean, I really think it's important for um, parents and teachers to work together um, on this and to begin talking and to begin finding out you know, what are those points of agreement um, and how can we work together on them to, uh, to, to uh, stop what's happening in the schools. Thank you. So, um, Toby. There's a question posed to you. You've been too utopian. Who's going to push back against these changes? If not now, then when? Well, we can't, we can't solve a problem we haven't understood. We have to understand the problem first. Um, there's no point being active uh, until we know what we're being active about. Um, I mean, one thing that does strike me is that the politicization of education begins in this country in the most pointed fashion in 1989 at the moment that history appears to have come to an end. So this, you know, with the 1989 Education Act introduced by Margaret Thatcher and the introduction of the national curriculum. So there seems to be a relationship between the end of history and the rise of education as a new form of politics. So that's one thing we've got to understand. I think we also need to understand when we call on the state to act, the law of perverse outcomes, because the irony of the national curriculum introduced in 1989 
in order to re-establish traditional knowledge-based curriculum is it nationalised a, a progressive curriculum. Precisely the opposite outcome was mm -hmm. achieved, uh, which is hilariously funny when you read the diaries of the time. <laughs> and they actually watched it happen and still couldn't stop it happening. So that's the law of perverse outcomes there. Um, the interesting thing about the current uh, government is that they promised to bring knowledge back in and they've introduced a national moral curriculum of indoctrination, the religious, sex, health and, and uh, health and uh, education curriculum. So they've done precisely the opposite of what they set out to do. So I, I, do, I do think it's really important that we uh, think about it a bit more before we act um, and try and understand the process. Otherwise, we will just end up compounding the problem. Um, I do think, uh, as Claire said at the front, I mean, the, the 1995 or 96 Education Act is really clear on indoctrination. The principles are at hand, the principles are at hand in order to defend education as, a, as an end in itself. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think we can make those arguments, but we need to understand the process at play here. Um, I, I, I love Nancy, but I do want to disagree um, with what she just said previously, which is I, I think parents provide moral instruction. I mean, essentially, domestic indoctrination, that's entirely fine. There could not be any other way to raise a child. Teachers provide moral education. It's much more open. It's a completely different thing. I'm not there to um, instruct of how somebody should live their life. I'm there to provide them with uh, ideas about how people have lived their life. And, that, and that's moral education. It's quite a different um, enterprise. And I, uh, and I ought to, and I do, respect the moral instruction of the parent. Um, and I would never question that. Thank you, Toby. Um, so, full disclosure, I work in a faith school, Catholic school, and I had a Catholic education as well. So I'm fully in favour of faith schools, never found a problem with them. But, Yaron, is there not a fault in your free market that these faith schools could bring in ideas that are completely antithetical to the society um, we live in? They will, and they do. And, um, you know, we get the education in a sense we deserve. Uh, and if parents uh, hold irrational ideas, uh, they will send their kids to irrational schools. And, and that's just the reality. And I think to impose ourselves, uh, going back to parents' rights, to impose ourselves on that, I think, I think is, uh, is fundamentally, uh, fundamentally wrong. And I think this idea of we get the education we deserve applies generally. If parents don't get involved, they will get education that is counter to what their values are and this is why parents have to get involved and the best way to get them involved is through a market system that's the way we can get parents uh most engaged uh, in this process i want to say something about the fact that what we see today is not new that is yes it's radical it's crazy it's insane uh it's it's way out there but these debates have been going on for a very long time certainly in the united states uh, should we teach evolution or, uh, or creationism in schools. Now, I know in Britain you would never have that debate, but in the United States this was a big debate and has is still a big debate. There are still school districts in the United States that teach creationism um, and, and not evolution. Uh, that, is, that is the kind of debate uh, we've had. There, there are many other debates where politics has entered, where a majority gets to decide what's taught in a school, and a minority has no choice about exposing their kids to something they don't believe in. So there you get your faith-based education snuck into the public schools in America, where if you're not faith-based, you, you have to sit through this uh, in spite of that. So, and, and let me just say, you can, over, you can, um, you can survive a faith-based education. Um, I, my, I spent two, uh, two plus years uh, in in uh, in uh, very low grades, I, I can't. I, the first two degrees in school here in London on the east side uh, uh, in Hackney, when Hackney was Hackney, um, in a very 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 Jewish school. You wore yarmulke every day and everything, and it, it, it's actually when I became an atheist. So it actually benefits. <laughs> hey, thank you, Yaron. Um, Joanne, maybe I could ask you one of my own questions then. So. The school you send your son to is going on about all these diff different issues. Do they ever talk about class? That's a very, very good question. And the answer, as far as I can see, is really not enough. Um, one of the points I made in my various um, lobbying efforts was that if they were serious about inclusivity, they should really extend the bursaries uh, and um, not spend so much money on glossy buildings but do their level best to go out and find these bright kids who deserve a place at the school 
um, and pay for them to be there. And um, one of the things actually that I'm most pleased about as a result of all of my making, uh, you know, being a pain in the neck, quite frankly, is that um, in a small way, um, they have changed some of the practices. For instance, we have various events during the year which are ticketed because they are fundraising for the bursary fund. And I've looked at these events and thought, quite frankly, you know, these are very expensive to attend. And I, you know, I spoke to the head and said, you know, would you think about maybe offering tickets to the bursary kids at the school, you know, free tickets for them. So now that, you know, they're looking at, at really questioning what inclusivity could mean in a broader sense. And I think that's really important. Hey, thank you. Um, <clears throat> and Christina, I'm interested in your thoughts as well about this, the comment about um, looking at the schools and they're going on about hate speech and how you've got to you know, you've got to um, educate the children about what their responsibilities are in society. But is this in some way overriding parental authority? Um, I was brought up in a faith school, convent school in the Far East in Malaysia. And it was just amazing because you had a proper old-fashioned British style schooling. Brilliant. And it was, it was uh, you didn't pay for it. But it felt like a what it is now here, uh, an independent school. So, of course, naturally, I sent my girls to convent school when I came here. Um, and I'm so glad that they are actually out of school because the schools they went to did not interfere with how I brought up my children and what they believed in. And they are out of that. They are their independent, stubborn self. And I'm really pleased because that's been... Uh, a combination of the school and me. But I do feel for for um, children go, going through the school now. Uh, another friend of mine, her daughter is in a university. I shouldn't mention the name of the university, should I? In London. And they're doing... I won't mention that it's Goldsmith. And they're doing <laughs> P, PGC. The, 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 so these are the future student, uh, teachers. Now, ableism, they are told, oh. is giving a prosthetic leg to somebody who needs it. That's ableism. They are told that. Um, and it is a safeguarding issue, they are told, when they become teachers, if a parent does not want their child, their six-year-old child, to transition. That becomes a safeguarding issue. Now, a student who, who questioned this during these classes has since been sidelined. So, and when you're sidelined during this university course, that does affect your chances going forward. Um, so then she said, um, she's doing this course, and she said a friend of hers wanted, for religious purposes, because she's come through her faith school, and she wanted to question this gender ideology and, and, uh, it's, and, and everything else that they were, they were promoting. And she actually told her friend, please don't, because if you do, you're going to be sidelined and you will lose out. So are these the teachers that are being trained to now teach your children? That is wrong, surely. We've got about five minutes for any burning questions, any burning comments. Would, would you agree that the Equality Act in schools is a major problem? Please tell us how the charter schools and the free schools here in Britain are doing dealing with these issues. I think as a parent, you have a natural to want to protect your child and look after their best interests. So uh, if you had a choice of schools between one that was academically strong but woke and one that was academically weaker and non-woke, which would you choose as a parent? Because I think that would actually be a genuine dilemma. And I think I'd most probably favour the school that was academically stronger, despite all my reservations about the other. So I just... just Thought I'd raise that. <laughs> so my son is 16 and we have a pretty good relationship. We can talk about a lot of stuff, but he never tells me what goes on at school, of course. But uh, I've noticed that uh, if I talk at all about the trans issue, his face tightens and he shuts down <coughs> and I can't really talk to him. And he's looking at me like I'm an absolute bigot. And I'm pretty certain I'm not. <laughs> and... Uh, it's quite upsetting, to be honest, but I feel like there's a wall and I just cannot get through it. I cannot penetrate. And so you're left wondering what the hell's Choice. happened there. How did that something, <clears throat> something untoward happen there? 
and I suspect that there's a lot of parents having that experience. The final thing I wanted to say was that I've never met a teacher that uh, was a fan of Michael Gove, and um, I'm not a teacher. I'm not a teacher, right? And I, I don't, I don't know all specifics, but there was that sense that the government, oh, the worst thing about teaching was teachers, <laughs> and that um, at least Michael Gove and the government was attempting to create some kind of buffer between the, the sort of woke liberalism of teachers, which seem to be out of control, because where else would you look to? Um, so, and, and I, I'm be curious whether other parents feel the same way, that, that uh, it's just a counter-argument to the idea that government should completely get out of, of education because, you know, maybe they are one of the few lines of defence left. Thank you. Hey, I'm just, um, it just feels a bit daunting to me because it feels like schools are sort of following some trends to keep up with what's happening with the world. And then a lot of the panel are sort of saying, oh, we need to stop that from happening because it's harming our kids. But I think there needs to be a balance because I'm not a mother, but I'm an auntie. And I've been learning in the last year so much from my niece and nephews, things that I never had the chance to learn when I was their age. I'll have my 10-year-old niece be able to say five incredible women who was the first astronaut, who was the first mechanics. There's, I, you know, I feel that the curriculum has to just keep adapting to things and has to keep implementing things that will benefit everybody as an individual. And at the same time, have parents to have the autonomy to have their say. But it's just, I think, the old traditional curriculum is not really a beneficial thing to move forward. And if anything, I think schools should have what we have here, open debates, discussions about things, so that people can actually not be restricted of saying what they think, but to actually talk more coherently about what is important and how to move forward. Thank you. I, I, I've got a, re a report with policy exchange coming out in about a week or two, hopefully, um, where we poll 18 to 20 year olds on what they were taught in school, and also adults, uh, adult public opinion on these cultural war issues. And I think it's a mistake to suggest that the public are divided, and I think Toby made this suggestion. On most of these questions, the public are very clearly, uh, roughly two to one or more in the majority are against these ideas. So we need to understand that this is the majority view, and it is not a debate that is even between these two sides. So this is one of the reasons I say there's a role for government. You mentioned Michael Gove. The government could essentially crack down on the civil service, crack down on the, P the Ofsted, the inspectorate, and the teachers to essentially make sure that they are doing the will of the people. I mean, that is what democracy is about. That's what Gove was doing. We need, if the government was serious, they could essentially make the kind of changes that we're seeing, say, with Yunkin in Virginia or DeSantis in Florida. I think that is the, really the only way this changes. It's not going to change from within. Again, the public opinion is very much on our side, I would say. Can you go back to the panel in reverse order in which we speak? So starting with Christina and coming over to Nancy, we got strictly one minute. I, I'll just be very quick. There are two things that I, I believe in. One is, um, no, three, listen to ideas, but don't be subjected to control. So just ideas and think about them. Um, and, you know, Teachers should not be activists in the classroom. If students do not know which way the teachers vote and what their personal views are, I think the teacher's done a bloody grand job. So uh, don't let them know. Discuss, let them discuss, but don't tell them your views and don't push your views onto them. And finally, there is no right not to, to be offended, and blasphemy is not a crime. Just You have to push that too. That's it. Thanks. Thank you, Joanne. Um, Absolutely. So I think I've been very privileged to sit on this committee as a parent because my experience as a parent is, you know, is my experience. It doesn't necessarily re reflect uh, how other people are able to connect with their schools. To answer Claire's question, who I would say is a huge authority on this whole area uh, from the parents' perspective, the Equalities Act, yes, I think it definitely needs to be reviewed. The logic of it seems to be extending into the curriculum, which I don't think is what it was intended to do. Um, the question about Michael Gove, I was a local councillor during the period 
of uh, the Gove Schools Revolution. I sat on, in fact, I chaired the schools committee for my local borough. I was all in favour of free schools because I felt it opened choice um, to parents, to students, and in a, in a sense to teachers as to what kind of institutions they wanted to be in. Something seems to have, uh, the, the promise of that revolution doesn't seem to have come fully to the fore. I'm not altogether sure why that is. Um, and the other story, I wanted to come back very quickly on the, on the question you asked me about, about class. Um, just a little episode. The former head of the school that my son goes to used to write quite often in the Sunday Times thoughtful pieces about education. He entered into the whole discussion about white working class boys and suggested that he would like to offer special bursaries at our school for white working class boys. And then when he retired a couple of years ago, I went to ask him about that and he said, I would not be able to say that now in public. Thank you. Yaron? Yeah, the political process is a, political, is a process by which the majority uh, determines for the minority uh, what is good for them. Uh, the beauty of the marketplace is that people can choose for themselves. Uh, people can choose what the kind of education they want their kids uh, to uh, to receive, and and uh, the majority doesn't have the opportunity to impose their will on them. And indeed, in terms of citizenship, that is the best kind of citizen we want. We want citizens who think for themselves. We want citizens involved in the process. We want citizens that care about the education their children get and are willing to put in the work and the effort to kind of uh, pick and choose between alternatives. And yes, at the end of the day, the debate about education is a philosophical debate. It's about the role of education and the purpose of education. That will never be resolved through politics because politics is about voting, not about philosophy. If you want to resolve that philosophical debate about the purpose of education, free up the space and let competing philosophies compete with one another and let's see who wins. Excellent, thank you, Toby. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm all for choice. I think that's a good thing. I just wanted to uh, reply um, to the last question from the floor uh, and to point out that in 2010, the UK coalition promised to kick moralism and ideology out of education and to bring knowledge back in. So they promised that in 2010. In 2022, they implemented a national moral curriculum which is in substance indoctrination, uh, green lighting, everything that we've been talking about. Why we would ask the state or those people to make our arguments to solve our political problems, I just, I, I just can't see why I would bother. I will get on with making my own arguments to everybody that I talk to. Thank you. And Nancy. Right. Well, um, I thought it was a lovely point over here about education. And I really agree with Toby that education should be about broadening children's perspectives. Um, it's giving them the gift of the world. And curricula does need to, um, does need to improve. It needs to develop and evolve. But that is not what is going on in schools right now. And we know this because the teachers and the teachers' unions, unfortunately, and the schools are trying to keep it secret from parents. <coughs> They're saying to children, don't show your parents. And, and that, is a really, that is a really dangerous sign. And I, I really think that um, I, in order to make a difference, we have to be willing to uh, to have the fullest discussion of this that we can with parents, with teachers, and we have to stick our necks out a bit because the perennial problem that comes up all the time in this is that, is that well, the majority agree with you, but where are they? Yeah. They're silent, <laughs> and, and that is a political problem. It's because we have not exercised the leadership to show those people that this is what we stand for and that they stand for too, and that it is important for them to stand up and be vocal about it. And just finally, I think, Yaren, Ed, democracy is about so much more than voting. It's about self-rule. And that is why we need to have the fullest involvement of parents and teachers in resolving what is a very real uh, politi existential political problem. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you, Spano. Thank you to all of you. Too.